Do you think they're ready? <clears throat> okay. So, I've heard some interest about in civil pasture already today. I think it's a great practice. It, uh, but as many people like it, you'll find as many foresters who don't think there should ever be livestock in the woods. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, civil pasture practice, how to integrate that into the farm and incorporate civil pasture as a part of your forest management. Um, in general, I, I tend to focus on cattle because cattle is big business in Missouri. Goats are coming up though as, a, as a certainly representing a product that the farmer can grow and, and an opportunity there. With cattle, I don't think you're managing the forest necessarily by the livestock. What I mean by that is I, the manager, manipulate the forest to benefit the cattle. That's a different story, a different side of the coin with goats. And we'll hear that with, with Mark Kennedy's talk. We'll see that with uh, the bi visit to Lincoln University's farm and what Charlotte's doing there. Their goats are actively involved with management of the forest. So I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, right off the bat, too, my background's in forestry, right? And I've, I've dabbled in agroforestry for a number of years. I've seen a lot of talks, and so I, I cover a lot of ground, but I owe a lot to folks like Rob Kallenbach, who's with uh, um, Forages and Agronomy and at the University of Missouri, Mark Kennedy, whom you're gonna hear talk, and Larry Godsey, our economist. I'm uh, not my own man. I've, I've learned a lot from other folks, and so I've tried to incorporate that, incorporate that in my talks. We'll go through pretty quickly here. It's in your manual. This is just kind of some visual and a different take on what's in your manual too. We'll talk about the definition of civil pasture, brief snippet of historical context, is it possible? Components of success, integrating the components, and we'll look at some case studies too to wrap up, see how people have taken what they've heard me say and applied it on their farm or how they've done it. So a civil pasture, combination of trees, forages, and grazing principles, integrated and managed to promote a broader resource utilization and enhance farm productivity. Sheep, dairy, beef cattle, goats, you name it. It's an integration on the farm for some interactive benefits. Civil pasture is not just turning your livestock loose in the forest. Um, you get overgrazing, you get a browse line, I don't know if you can see it, but that's what this picture is down in the bottom left here. It's also not just having two or three trees out in a paddock where livestock over congregate, over utilize an area. Forage is diminished and you get an accumulation of waste and, and animal byproducts, trampling and, and compaction of the soil. So that's not civil pasture. It comes from the term combination of civil culture, the art and science of tending and producing the management of a forest and also pasture management selected production of quality forage for grazing by livestock. So it's an integration of pasture and silviculture. Historical success. If you've looked at the National Agroforestry's website, there's a lot of material there on how to go from a pasture to a civil pasture, but, but how to incorporate civil pasture in the south is a, is a, is a, the knowledge is a commodity there. They do it successfully down in the south with pine production. In the Midwest, much less has been done. On looking at civil pasture, we have longer rotations. The forest environment takes a longer, you know, I heard resilience mentioned as well. The forest environment just behaves differently than with your pines and the rotation lengths are differently, are different. So we've only demonstrated short-term success in looking at civil pasture on a, in our hardwood forest. However, one example of a success, even though it's a different climate, certainly over in Spain they have what's called a dehesa system. It's a curious read if you want to look up the dehesa system and how they've managed the integration of sheep, cattle, hogs, grazing on acorns from oak trees over there. So it's a very curious read, but these systems of widely spaced trees integrating animals into this uh, savanna-like environment they call dehesa over there, it's shown long-term success, so thousands of years. I've also looked at some information that says they're struggling with how to renew that system, right? So how long does a, what's, what's the lifespan of a, say a white oak species? 
Forrester's in the room. Uh, it depends. That's a good question. <laughs> or that's a good answer. That's a great response. Yeah, so <laughs> it's always people that sit up front always pay better attention than those in the back. So, all right, so how long is a white oak tree going to live? Just to give, huh? 200 years. 200 years. So, takes you 20 years to get an education. You're probably not going to be around when that tree dies, right? So you can do a lot of management around that tree, utilization of that tree, even outside of the wood products, from the acorns to mass production and other things. You won't be around to see it senesce or die. So the cycle, we may or may not be a part of that cycle unless we're proactive right now, visionary, to when that tree's going to die. So if a tree lives 300 years, you know, that's several lifetimes, right? It takes a strong vision to be thinking ahead that far and planning today to make sure that that system persists on the landscape. But anyway, it's, it's, I think it's possible. So, components of success. Now, this should say tree shade management up here, right? Well, I did a little resizing of my slides because I noticed the slides were getting chopped. Now, this is the downside of that. We get tree shad E management. So, so tree shade management, livestock husbandry, and forage management. We'll kind of look and touch on those and how those work together to create a successful civil pasture practice. So, do cattle need shade? Mark Kennedy, thank you. It does depend, right? What does it depend on? Lots of different factors. Are cattle grazing in the fight infected fescue? There are some great new novel fescues out there. I was asking Mark about that just over the break. We're going to put in some trials of that material out on the Wordak Research Center. These are fescues infected with endophyte, but not the kind that's detrimental to the circulatory uh, systems of livestock. But are they grazing endophyte infected fescues? The temperature humidity index over 72. We'll talk in just a minute about what that means. Have the cattle been selected for short hair coats and heat tolerance? Is there plenty of good water present? What's the overall condition of your animals? What are the animals accustomed to? So when we say it depends, it's a, that's a broad blanket statement, but it does depend. Are your cattle used to heat? Are they new? Do they have long coats, short coats? Do they shed soon, or, I mean early in the season? Do they keep their hair on into the early part of the summer? When is shade needed? Well, there's some good research from the dairy producers primarily looking at temperature and humidity index. So we all know in Missouri at least that there's a relationship between the humidity level outside, the temperature, and the stress that puts on our system, right? So the research that they've done in dairies would say that a, that relationship, when the relationship between temperature and humidity is over 72, livestock, cattle primarily, begin to start seeing some mild stress. What does stress do to productivity? It diminishes productivity, right? The, uh, the feed efficiency and, every, and other th factors related to productivity go down in an animal. So you want to reduce stress. So anything above a temperature humidity index of 72, and this is just a nice table that's out there, and I think they're making, they're going to print some of these out, but this will be online. You're welcome to have the slides. You want to protect your animals from stress. And this is really where the shade aspect out in the pasture comes to bear on animal productivity. And there is an app for that. <laughs> There's a gentleman here at the University of Missouri who put out an app called Thermal Aid. That when you plug in the condition of your animal, including its health, a number of different factors, it produces a, in addition to showing you what the real-time temperature is, it also produces a temperature humidity index for you. So it's a little 99 cent app. I'm not sure that it tells you anything you don't already know, but it's a way to be engaged anyhow as a farmer, as a landowner, as a producer, in considering and understanding that heat and stress play a role on your animal's productivity, its health, and it's productivity. So, is shade good or bad? When isolated only a few areas of the paddock, nutrient transfer is deemed a negative. And so I just would reemphasize that. <clears throat> it's not grazing in the woods, not just putting your animals out in the woods 
opening up a section, taking, opening up the gate and letting livestock run through the woods. Neither is it just having two or three trees out in the pasture where the animals congregate. So shade benefits. And there's, you know, I can pull some literature on this for you from other talks if you'd like it. But you'll see improved animal condition, improved milk productivity, improved breeding efficiency, improved feed intake, improved weight gain, and improved nutrient distribution across your paddock where you have shade available for your animals. Now, nutrient distribution is an it depends because it depends on where your shade is with respect to your water and so. But other areas where it depends, animal selection, temperature humidity index, the type of forage that you're grazing on, and whether you're applying rotational grazing. So, now let's take a little bit, little look at the forage management. So this is just a slide to right up front highlight the fact that different uh, livestock will utilize different forages, everything from browse to grass to forbs. So knowing your animal is important. I'm not telling you all anything new, but it's, these are questions you have to ask the landowners, right, to make sure that if they're grazing, that their forage is appropriate for the livestock they've got. And from our perspective, we don't just blanket produce one civil pasture design that fits all, right? So what is management intensive grazing and rotational grazing? This chart has days of rest down here at the bottom, so they're talking about days of rest of your paddock, availability of forage on, on the left, and then uh, the digestible dry matter over here on the right. Rotational grazing, management intensive grazing, these are ways to, to manage the forage growth and manipulate or the relationship between quantity, the availability of the forage, and quality, the, the, uh, the protein or energy that 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 forage has for the livestock. Early on in grasses, in the regrowth of grass, the energy level is really high on it. it and, and so when you see continuous grazing systems, you'll see clumps of older grass out there and they continue to go back and just re-eat the new grass, right? They overuse the grass as it comes back because as soon as it starts to regrow, it's got a high nutritional value for that animal. And they go back and they just nip it off again. However, there's very little of that available. So the idea when you let your paddock rat rest through a rotation of moving animals on and off there is to somehow balance out that relationship between availability and nutritional value of that forage. So in general, and I'll summarize this at the end, but we're talking about 20 to 45 days worth of rest on a paddock or on a, a, an area of ground that you are actively grazing. And, um, that changes. There's no prescribed period because cool season grasses, warm season grasses, seasonally they all grow differently, right? Moisture available, they all grow differently. So you have to time your activity based on the season, the available uh, moisture and other factors that go into growing that grass. But the benefits, and maybe we'll talk some uh, when we look at the ecological benefits to agroforestry, but the benefits when we do apply rotational grazing are seen over here in better root growth as you, if you relieve a good amount of residual green leaf above the ground. So it's a balancing act between what you see above the ground and what you get below the ground. You can remove anywhere up to about 50% of the above ground leaf growth with minimal impact in terms of root loss. So 50% of the leaf is removed above you've only stopped root growth at two to four percent. But by the time you go up to grazing 80 percent of your above ground leaf growth off, you've stopped 100 percent of your below ground root growth. So when we talk about erosion problems or concerns, um, water infiltration back into the soil profile, nutrient movement down into the soil profile versus running off, if you overgraze or if the producer overgrazes, the likelihood is that root growth is also stopping below the ground and may subject that pasture to other um, ecological concerns. So in designing civil pasture practice, um, typically grazing periods less than five days. The Fred March example, 
what did he have? He had 8,000 pounds per acre. And then uh, he had, what was the other? The, for the grazing period, he had 16 to 24,000 pounds per acre. So um, he's leaving his animals on there for two to three days is what it sounds like to me. And then he's moving them on to the next pasture. Um, Mark, you can correct me, but my farm manager, Brent Booker, which we'll meet down at Wordak, he said that after three days, grass begins regrowth again. In the spring of the year, definitely. So it depends, but in, in the spring of the spring year. In springtime, during fast growth, about three days. So it becomes important you move your animals off as that grass begins to regrow because the tendency of the animal, again, is to go back for the candy, that highly nutritious, good material. And so they tend to overgraze and overgraze that plant as it starts to renew its growth. They go right back for that new growth. So Fred March is doing a good job, it sounds like, of moving his animals every two to three days to minimize overuse of individual plants out in his pasture. So rest periods in of 20 to 45 days, depending on grass growth rates. In general, you can, on cool season grasses, put animals in when the grass is 8 to 10 inches tall. Take them out when, they're, when it's three to four inches tall. Warm seasons, put animals in at 10 to 18 inches in, in forage height and out six to eight inches. Monitor and evaluate and then always make adjustments as needed. Right, very few of these are walk away deals. Um, they require some intensive management and paying attention to details and monitoring how your paddock and pasture and livestock are doing. So some insights from research. Um, when looking at the civil pasture practice, we did some controlled studies under shaded environments, uh, shade cloth, where we gave the plants all the water and nutrients they needed. Under 50% shade, cool season grasses and forbs seem to do quite well, both in terms of yield and also their quality improving in terms of digestibility and, 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 uh, and nutrient content. So this, this this slide here was put together by Jerry Van Zambeek, I believe, who's with the Forest Service, summarizing a lot of what the research shows uh, in terms of shade tolerance for many of your cool season uh, grasses and legumes. The dark green down the middle shows kind of the average of what literature would indicate. So but what you can see is that 50% light or shade covers many of the cool season grasses and 50% light or shade is about down the middle for, for a number of your uh, clovers as well. Additionally, some of the research that Rob Kallenbach has done at the university highlights the productive differences between civil pasture and traditional pasture. So we're looking at open pasture, it tends to start producing a little later in the year. It shows a tremendous peak in forage availability and forage yield, and then it drops off precipitously over the summer with a nice little peak again out in the fall. When we look underneath the canopy of the trees and the modification of climate that those superimpose on a growing condition down at the level, uh, at the ground level, in the civil pasture system, forage starts growing a little bit sooner in the spring. It doesn't peak near as high in terms of yield, but neither does it does it, uh, does it drop to a low over the summer that as, as the open forage does? So there's a little bit more consistency and early productivity as well as an extended growing season out into the fall. So there are some real trade-offs in terms of forage production and its response to the environment underneath the civil pasture practice. And to hear Rob Kallenbach talk, the ideal forage is one that produces a single flat line all year long. Because then you know exactly how many animals to put out there, how long they need to be on. It's a very predictable system, right? So anytime we can minimize the highs and lows, we produce a more stable system for grazing animals. So that's a positive. I got three minutes left. Five is what Mike says. So the next thing you have to be considered of when designing civil pasture is, uh, is your distance from water. It influ animals Typically, you'd like for them to come to water as individuals. That's more likely when, you, when your water is no more than six or 800 feet, um, when it's no longer than 600 to 800 feet to your water at any place in your paddock. 
you get much better utilization of your grass then. If they have to travel too far from the water, they're less likely to use the periphery of your, pat, of your pasture, and they're more likely to want to move as a herd to the water. So a little bit of forest management. There are some ways to put artificial shade in the pasture, but it's extremely pricey when you look at materials and labor and time to assemble these and to then move these around because you end up with a single shade structure out in your pasture over utilization of the ground right underneath it. So you have to move those. It becomes very challenging as well as and costly. So trees in the pastures and pastures into the forest. First thing you need to do is select appropriate species for the site. You can do that by looking at soils, what's growing adjacent to the area, and also digging a hole. I think sometimes the simplest is, is an easy way to go. You can dig a hole, see if there's impediment to root growth, such as a clay pan or rock layer or other things that, can, uh, that may limit your species selection for growth on that area. So match the trees to the site, look for light producing or light impact on the shade. Walnut's a great one, pecan's a great one. It will grow on the site. Um, look at the products produced, the high value products versus um, other opportunities and whether or not they're deep rooted trees. Ideally deep, deep rooted means they'll compete less for moisture with the grass and also cycle nutrients from deep in the soil profile. However, weed control is important. Can't overemphasize weed control if you want your trees to perform, especially seedlings. You got to control the grass right around the trees. As the tree gets older, that becomes less a factor in its performance and its growth. But when it's young, control the grass around the tree. And protection from grazing. Now that may sound funny, we're talking about civil pasture, right? But especially with young trees, you need to fence the livestock off the trees. No, no grass control here either. So. Um, but keep the livestock off the trees when they're young and as they're growing, cattle and other animals like to rub on them, goats will climb them, so. But we put trees in the pasture, you get to choose the species and you get to choose the spacing. A lot of real benefits when we look at management from the farmer's perspective, both uh, the shade management, manipulation for their livestock, mowing, fencing, and also ultimate product harvest. So. There are some benefits of putting trees just into the pasture. If we look at putting pasture into the trees, this is where most foresters cringe, but uh, we're managing light levels again, which is not something new to foresters. We are uh, using appropriate management for the site in our selection of tree species, and really we're applying what could be defined as a crop tree release practice. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. But the biggie here is rotational grazing, which is something different compared to what most foresters are used to. We see continuous grazing. They let the cows in the trees because they were stressed. Did the cows come out of the tree? The farmer says, I don't know. So, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna skip over this real quickly. But in general, on a study that I did down on the Wordak farm, we reduced our tree count down to 67. We reduced our number of trees per acre by about 60%. So we took out a lot of trees, but that includes some smaller undergrowth trees as well. Emphasis on white oak and black oak is our residual stand, but the greater emphasis on white oak. Um, so stocking was ultimately about 40% of what it was prior to. We used a crop tree selection, thinned the crowns, so we looked up, at the, up in the trees and we said, we liked, I like this white oak right here. And I made sure it was open all the way around it and then went over to the next tree so that I had about 50% sky between canopy tree, canopy tree. So I had about 50% canopy over the whole area. That's just an overhead depiction, for, I think from a Forest Service publication of what that looks like. But we thinned for light and we tried to thin for quality. And here it is over the winter when we actually did our thinning. There it is then in the spring. You got to plan for a lot of different activities when you're doing this too, including soil tests, soil amendment, lime and fertilizer, grass seeding, regeneration, and future thinnings. Um, 
probably going to thin about every five to seven years would be my guess. We, uh, it's a different... It's the, so the challenge is you get a more acidic soil out there because it, in our case we had oak leaves and tannins probably accumulating in the soil runoff. So when we converted this into a grass, then the nutrient management out there became based on forage. So we sampled the soil and it was done based on a forage needs, yes. So we had to adjust the pH and then... Uh, we actually put some clover out there, so we didn't put any nitrogen, but put some P and K on there. We did. We sold we sold trees during the thinning. What was yeah. for saw logs, and then we also um, we also had the logger was also cutting firewood, so he took out a lot of smaller stuff that he used for firewood. But it was still pricey. And I can't remember the exact figures on that, Larry, but it was pricey. Um, pricey from a forester's perspective. Now we'll get into some prices here in just a second too, and I'm going to run a touch long, but we'll uh, I'll roll through some of this. So uh, we can we can discuss more about the impacts of this practice, but I'd say it was it was positive on the forest development. Time will tell though. So let's just take a quick peek at some case studies, gentlemen down in South Central Missouri. Uh, Mr. Tomazi was grazing 210 acres in 31 different paddocks, 69 acres per paddock, had 84 uh, cow, head of cow-calf operation, 84 head of livestock, do, is doing rotational grazing, implemented civil pasture to improve weight gain during the heat of the summer. And so, these are pictures from Larry Godsey that I, I pirated to my full abilities. I may not do as good a job of talking about them as Larry does. But so this is part of the, the area that Brian is grazing. You can't see, but right here is his watering system for, I think he had four paddocks right around that watering system. His implementation of civil pasture was to come around the edges and, and thin the forest around the property, around the, the paddocks. He only thinned 0.9 acres, not quite an acre, half an acre, and then 1.4 acres. So a total of a little bit less than three acres was actually thinned in, in doing this. And he pushed his fence from the edge back into the woods a little bit. And so there's a part, there's edge one where he actually uh, did the thinning. There's edge two. He thinned and planted some grass. And then there's uh, the, the third edge that he's done. He's also pruned up his trees in there hoping to let a little bit more light through by removal of the lower branches. The bottom line, it cost him about $1,200 per acre to implement. He ran his own equipment, but he esti Larry estimated those costs based on what he would have charged somebody if he was the equipment operator, I believe. So about $3,500 total cost to do a little bit less than three acres in grant. In but this year, when he was, uh, and this was in 2010, other farmers were seeing either zero gain or a pound of lost per calf because of the heat stress on those animals. Brian was seeing 1.6 to 2.1 pounds per day. So it depends on your producer, but Brian was seeing a gain where others in his area were actually seeing a either zero, no gain, or an actual loss in the weight of the animals. So it all told when he sold his calves off, he saw a benefit the cost ratio of about three to four dollars. So he saw three to four times what it cost him to, to build this practice, he saw returned from that practice. Did I say that okay, Larry? Forcer's layman term there. In another uh, setup, the, uh, the w Earl Williams farm, he's actually growing walnut in rows. So his goal is to grow walnut for nut production primarily and he's got orchard grass and red clover, I think, growing between those. But he's got a mix of grasses. He is cash renting this land out to his neighbor to graze while his trees are growing. The bottom line, all his inputs and everything else, it, it was costly, but he's estimated, again, a little over a four uh, cost-to-benefit ratio of about four, four to one. So he's exceeded, 
he's getting four dollars back for every one dollar he invests in general. I don't, Larry. Do you remember if it was? Yeah. So a pretty good return in those two examples. Um, so we'll, we'll wrap up here, but uh, proper tree spacing is good light management. Proper livestock management or husbandry is rotational grazing, and then base your forage selection on a grazing plan and the light available. We're managing interactions here. Um, so I'm going to talk about what it takes to be successful. I'd say is the landowner practicing rotational grazing is number one. Number two, does each paddock have water that should if they're doing rotational grazing? Overseed forage is necessary to develop an appropriate shade tolerant pasture. Manage and maintain tree spacings. It's not a one and done shot. If you thin the forest, you're going to have to re-enter it again because the canopies will begin to expand to fill that open, open area. Um, and plan to integrate paddocks with trees to the grazing system so livestock stress is minimized. You don't necessarily need trees on every paddock. You don't need a civil pasture on every paddock. Or in, like in uh, the Tamazi case, you may just thin the edges so cattle move from the water to the, to the shade and graze in between, right? Not every acre of your paddocks has to be civil pasture. It's about integration. Problem areas, potential problem areas, wrong forages or too much shade for forage production. In the livestock arena, the lack of rotational grazing plan, which might also be just leaving the gates open on your paddocks. Distance to water is too far. Um, and the trees, if you don't put the, again, you may have the wrong tree for the site or no plan for regeneration in the future. So a lack of extended vision for that property. All right. I think what I would suggest here is that Mark Kennedy talk to you, and then you can hit us both with a couple with questions if you got them. All right, you okay with that? There you go, sir. Okay. Okay, I'm coming at this totally different from most of y'all because my background is in animal science and forage management. Uh, and I come from Arkansas, which is a state where goat is a verb. Uh, <laughs> I grew up a lot of the neighbors, you know, we're, go we're going to goat that pasture off or goat that piece of land off. Uh, so, uh, and as I said earlier, I'm cheap and lazy and like to find somebody else or something else to do my work for me where I got into the goats. And I'm not an economist, and this is just my quick, as I call it, my cowboy math, but I try to sell multiflora rose, buckbrush, cerise celespides, a honeysuckle, ironweed, and some of the junk stuff out there that most cattle producers can't get their cows to eat. And based on last week's prices, I'm selling it for $600 a ton, which in the Ozarks, that's probably, that's more than about any other legal crop we can grow. <laughs> <laughs> Alfalfa is the other legal one, and it, you know, even last year during the drought, it got up to $300 a ton, so my multiflora rows and stuff still better. Uh, and the way I base that, it takes about five pounds intake to get a pound of gain on these goat kids. Uh, the market wants a 60 to 70 pound kid. Last week they were bringing $1.70 a pound, so uh, come up actually about $680 a ton of the plant material going through those animals. And it's free. On vegetation management, uh, there's a lot of studies being going, going on by other universities, Forest Service, and different ones using goats to uh, do certain jobs. Goats are being used to reduce fuel loads, to reduce wildfires out west quite a bit. Uh, there's actually Quite a few folks, not so much in Missouri, but in a lot of the other states, where, you know, if you're a cattle producer and you take your cattle to somebody else's land, you get to pay them rent. 
if you've got goats and you take your goats to somebody else's land, and I've done this a little bit, uh, they get to pay you vegetation management. Uh, pretty good deal, but there's some people in the U.S. doing it in a big way, scattered around uh, trailering goats to different places, doing specific jobs in environmentally sensitive areas where chemicals can't be used, where we can't get in with equipment and whatnot, and uh, the goats can do it. And they're an environmentally friendly alternative if they're managed properly. And this is, Charlotte may recognize that one, is a clip. We're using this in, whoop. I think there's a little arrow down probably your lower right hand yeah. corner there. Yeah. There we go. It's not wanting to go on this one. No, I don't know why. Hmm. Anyway, uh, that's what we're doing up at, I'm working with Charlotte and Lincoln University on a project up at our plant material center at Ellsbury. Uh, and I'm not, I guess I need to back up. When I work with producers on utilizing goats in the woodlands, I want to look or have a forester or somebody look at those woodlands first. Uh, I'm not suggesting putting goats in high quality woodlands that the understory vegetation is desirable regenerative growth. But in the Ozarks, especially, you know, or South Missouri, so much of everything was open graze for years that most of the understory vegetation is going to be the undesirable stuff, like the multiflora rose, buck brush honeysuckle, wild grape, and stuff that's just kind of taking over the woods and you're not getting the desirable species below. Uh, so I get a lot of calls from the field offices because there are people wanting to utilize goats in those, but generally I'll go out there and work with a producer and look at those areas to see what we're looking at. Uh, Ellsbury, our plant material center, and Doug went up there and looked at it too. Uh, most of the understory vegetation in that was uh, bush honeysuckle, uh, buckthorn, and some sumac and some other undesirable species. It was in an area that's hard to get into mechanically, and it was going to be a lot of, because of the where they were at, it was going to be hard to do chemically as well. Uh, the only problem, not everybody's quite as forward thinking as some of us, uh, we suggested this first in 1996. We got it approved, what, two years ago, Charlotte? Uh, I'm persistent. I can outlive state conservationists. <laughs> uh, so, saw that. Uh, North Carolina has done quite a bit of work with uh, utilizing goats in pastures and in some of their woodlots to reduce uh, a lot of the herbaceous weeds, vines, multiflora rose, blackberry, and hardwood. Uh, West Virginia, uh, in some of the pastures, it was coming up with predominantly brush. They reduced brush cover from 45% to 15% in one grazing season. Uh, multiflora rose, which is a uh, on our noxious weed list here in Missouri, and is a problem in a lot of areas. Uh, Ohio State did a study. They eliminated 92% of the multiflora rose in one year using goats, uh, and that was better than their chemical applications, but it may take up to four years to get total elimination. And that's been about the same uh, results that I've seen uh, on my own. Uh, Kerr Center did a, a five-year study back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, utilizing goats to reduce brush cover of the undesirable species, mainly uh, blackberry, greenbrier, winged elm, hickory, buckbrush, and red cedar. Uh, and they had it down to less than 10% brush and weeds after five years, and they made a profit. On this one here, they got it down to 20% brush and weeds after the five years, and were still being able to make a profit, and that's when goats were not selling very high. Uh, Cerisa lespedes is another one that's uh, a noxious weed in a lot of states and some of our woodlands. 
uh, that have been overgrazed in the past by cattle. Uh, a lot of the understory vegetation I'm seeing, Cerise Lespatiza, and some of those, especially if there's any sunlight getting down. Uh, but goats can be used for that. Uh, they do a good job on the Cerise Lespatiza, which cattle don't because of the high tannin content, but goats kind of, they've got an affinity or can take, intake will be higher on the high tannins than what cattle will. And with goats and sheep, the high tannin containing plants are a good thing because those high tannins help reduce the worm load. The tannins will actually kill off and, re and keep the internal parasites from reproducing. <coughs> so uh, it's a good thing for sheep and goat producers because internal parasites in this environment is the thing we fight the most. Uh, I've eliminated when it's my goal, and I want to point that out. Goals, you need to have your goal to start off with. What do you want to do and how quick? Uh, in some places, I wanted to eliminate some stuff fairly quick. I've been able to eliminate buckbrush, ironweed, multiflora rose, and blackberry from pastures and woodlots in one growing season when that was my goal. Uh, I think goats and woodland management have uh, great potential as biological agents to control that unwanted vegetation. Uh, studies have shown that 65% of the diets during July and August were made up of the, basically the stuff we're wanting to get rid of and not the desirable species. Uh, excessive damage to the desirable trees did not occur until later on in the year if they were still in there and were running low on feed during the winter time. Uh, the thing to keep in mind that understory vegetation I don't necessarily manage to kill it as quick as I used to because uh, I've got to look at I want to keep a little bit of brush in the understory I want to keep a little bit coming back in the pasture I want to thin it down I don't want it taking over the pastures don't want it taking back over the woodlots but I want to keep some of that in there because that's uh, desirable food source for the goats that are eating up higher, uh, not taking in as much of the internal parasite loads. Uh, Dusty showed you that one. I tell producers we need to look at what our resources are when I'm doing planning with a producer. Look at what the resources are, what that availability of vegetation is going to be, whether it's going to be predominantly brush, uh, Broadleaf weeds, or is it open pasture? If it's open pasture, they may not need any goats. But if we've got some of these other things occurring, then uh, goats can be used. And then look at those woodlots. You know, can we use the goats in there to do something? And I'm also trying to thin my woods to more of a civil pasture, savanna type deal, where the kind of like what Dusty's done over at Wardak, and I will go in and hinge cut because I'm cheap and lazy. I hinge cut those trees because if I cut them all the way through, the goats just get to eat the leaves off the tops once. Generally, if I hinge cut, they fall over. They'll take all those leaves off, but generally I'll get at least one more browsing over that, and I still get the dead tree, which is what I'm after, and opening up space providing some sunlight. Uh, with goats, they prefer browse. When I turn them into a pasture, they're going to go after the tall weeds or browse before they hit the grass or the clover. Uh, they prefer rough, steep land over flat, smooth. I have no problem accommodating them there. I live in Texas County. They tend to graze the perimeter of a pasture before the center. I think there's a couple of reasons why, or three reasons that I've come up with. First one is they're going to see if there's a way to get out. How good your fence is. Second, they need to look around the edge to determine where's going to be their safety spot in case of predators. Where can they see better? Where are they going to make their camp out spot at night? And third, I think, I watch my goats when I turn them into a pasture or the woodlot, they go around the perimeter, but they want to see what food source is going to be ideal 
this grazing because it changes from one grazing to the next. And they're not going to commit to filling their belly up as soon as they go into the gate if there's going to be something, you know, a nice multiflora rose bush over here first. Uh, what I like about goats, they're the easiest to manage and pasture of any animal. They graze stuff down in uniform layers. Anytime you see stuff that's overgrazed by goats, it's not the goat's fault, it's the, the guy that owns them that's not moving them soon enough. Uh, there's just some pictures I've put in. Uh, this is based on my observation over a number of years and some other studies that I've seen out there kind of I divided it up into desirable brows, desirable forbs, the intermediate forbs and intermediate brows like on cedar. And I've, I've got some areas that I'm trying to reduce or eliminate cedar because it tends to be a problem down there. Uh, cedar, generally, they're not going to utilize cedar except kind of between Christmas Day and late March uh, during that winter time. Period, they will browse on cedar a little more even if they've got plenty of forage to go along with it they'll tend to browse then or maybe during a drought. The grasses, uh, several different grasses they'll utilize. The undesirable species and these are these are basically the only ones that I really have to watch. Uh, these are all toxic to some degree or another. Horse nettle is toxic, but they don't eat enough of the horse nettle. They'll just eat all of the blooms and the berries off of it. Uh, you'll see some leaves taken every once in a while, but they don't eat enough. Perilla mint, they just won't touch. Woolly croton, they won't touch. They've got sense enough to know it's toxic. Uh, Lanceleaf ragweed, while not toxic, they because of that gummy substance on it, they won't take it until after it's been frosted. Wild cherry is the only one I really have to worry about in the, when I'm grazing in the woodlots. And generally with cattle producers, they have to worry about it after a windstorm. But with goats, you've got to worry about those goats that will raise up and pull that lowest limb that they can reach down. And then there's about five other goats waiting for those leaves as they, one of them pulls the branch down. If they snap that limb, and if they leave any leaves on that limb that grazing, and they come back by there tomorrow and that leaf is wilted, I'm going to have a dead goat within about 10 foot of that tree. Uh, so wild cherry is one i got to watch on the native grasses. Switchgrass will cause photosensitivity in goats. And Are you intentionally eliminating cherries from your I have eliminated most of the limbs that are low enough for them to get up and browse on. There aren't very many high quality black cherry right. logs grown in Missouri, especially down in the Ozarks. Right. Now, they can grow some, but <clears throat> but for the most part, he's probably not going to grow a, a high quality black cherry. Uh -uh. Not in my soils. So, so. Or lack thereof. I would say it's not a bad management right. practice for and him. I have cut a few out, but a lot of them I've gone through and pruned the limbs up to, to where the goat, there's not going to be, where they don't have the opportunity to pull that limb down and snap it. Uh, stocking rates and the thing I say if we're trying to eliminate species with goats it's management intensive grazing in reverse. We're putting them in there trying to to utilize a lot of the plant and then move them out but come back instead of giving it that long rest period come back as soon as that plant leaves out. Uh, but for sustainable brush browse management typically most of our pastures and woodlands could sustainably handle one to three goats per acre and leave some diversity of plants out there. Uh, I rule of thumb, two goats per acre per percent brush cover. Uh, if you had 60 percent brush cover, and this would be for sustainable. Now like the, the deal at Ellsbury, and other projects I've worked on where we're trying to eliminate it in a hurry, we're going to be looking at that if we've got the animals 8 to 12 goats per acre. And then when they're in any one pasture, they're going to be more than that. Uh, but if for sustainable browse management, if I had 60% browse cover times uh, 2, 
two goats per percent, that'd be 1.2 goats per acre. I think it's a, you know, we're saying this can't be done in an unmanaged situation, so you need to develop a site-specific plan, list of the target species to control, the owner's objectives, whether it's elimination reduction or sustainable browse management, the, then figure out the number, type, and density of grazing animals to use, and the duration, frequency, and timing of grazing. Develop a monitoring plan. You've got to go out there and see what's happening and adjust your plan based on what's actually happening because a lot of cases, they may be eating a little bit more than we thought they were or there's not quite as much stuff out there. We've had to adjust our plans at Ellsbury a few times because it's not growing back quite as quick as what we had originally projected. Uh, for, if we're trying to eliminate plants, I think we need to have some two to five paddocks. And this is where, when we're in, and this is what we're doing at Ellsbury, and we're trying to defoliate 80% of the target species while they're in there. And within a short period of time, one to two weeks, rotate out to another area, come back in when that's leafed back out to a half to two thirds leaf, and keep repeating that process. On the other hand, when I'm trying to do sustainable browse management, which is what I'm trying to do on my place now, I wait till it's at full leaf. You know, let that plant get fully leafed out, and I'm only trying to defoliate now 25 to less than 50 percent of the leaves on it before I move them to the next pasture. And I'm putting in that rest period that's 25 to 45 days, and that's another one of those it depends because last year during the drought the rest period was 90 days in between before I could come back to some of those areas. Some of the things that producers will have to keep in mind is predator control and this is a whole one day workshop in itself the things I've got listed up here so I had to shorten it down. Fencing your facilities, parasite control, pasture and grazing management, marketing, marketing them, and then there will be some advantages if we can get all of those things lined out. Some useful references. Uh, the Targeted Grazing Handbook uh, put out by University of Idaho. Uh, I think they University of Idaho and the Amer American Sheep Industry Council, uh, Maryland Small Remnant Page, uh, Kathy Vos Livestock for Landscapes website. She does a lot of work uh, in vegetation management around the country. Uh, Langston University, North Carolina State, e-extension website's got some good useful information, and Lincoln University's got some good useful information. There's all sorts of information on the website. What gets scary is when you look to what some of the people are posting on there on some of the chat sites, and uh, I stick with information that I can kind of trust. And I think with that, uh, for an Arkansas boy, I talk pretty fast <laughs> today. <laughs> I saw two hands come up. We'll go work from the back to the front. If that's what I'm still in the process of slowly, I'm doing this slowly because I want to stay in the guilt business because I'm making a profit with them. So I'm going slow and I'm not to that point yet. But if, if you did it at a faster rate of speed, then we would probably be shifting uh, species of livestock at one point in time. Then you might shift from goats back to cows and periodically you may have to run goats in there to control undesirables if they start coming back. Well, Sorry, Rich, you had a question. We'll come up front here. Uh, we talked about tool pasture and uh, how, how many trees are making too many trees. If 
in the state, have you get a, get a sense of at what point is it too few trees that you're creating a problem? Uh, like you said, you know, the one or two trees per plant you're creating is that the problem? Definitely. A great question, and one time in the back of my feeble mind, I might have had you a, a good answer. Do you have an answer off the top of your head? Not. Um. No, and I think part of that, I know from a livestock perspective and thinking about those concentration areas and everything, is going to get into your how well are those few trees distributed over that landscape? Are they going to be all up there in one area? Are they more evenly distributed over the entire landscape where then that you might could get by with a lower density of trees than if it was only on part of it? And there is a good publication out there on managing oaks for in savannas by I think it's Jay Law and Paul Johnson. I don't have the figure off the top of my head, but what sharper guys than me and the Forest Service have done is calculated the uh, maximum crown area, you all familiar with any of that? But, but for, for the diameter of a tree, there is a necessary amount of crown that that tree must have to support, through photosynthesis, to support the growth of that tree. And so they've re run some calculations on maximal, maximum crown area, and even though I think then that relates to the width of the crown and, and other things. So, so there, so that's kind of a backwards way into saying that uh, if you decide how big a tree you want to produce out there, then that will dictate how many of those you can put out there on a per acre basis and still maintain a requisite amount of open space between those canopies to, to grow forage light environments. And uh, we're going to work back up here, but we'll, yeah. I see. Okay. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking 30% was our, but I couldn't remember. Do you remember the title of that publication just right off? Managing Oak Savannas or something. Gentlemen, do you have some input on that question too? Okay, well, I'm going to jump up to this guy and then we'll go back to you, all right? So. Um, or I want to say we used a real high, a real high pure live seed, PLS. I think we used like, and we just did fescue out in ours. I, at the time, they, we used tall fescue, so it's got into fight. It was not the novel or the friendly into fight grass. I think we used something like 30 pounds pretty high. But the price of that fescue is relatively cheap in overall implementation. Um, in some areas in the Ozarks, in some of the areas that I'm working with, I'm going to get some of my cool season grasses are going to creep in around the edge, but some of mine I'm managing for the, and I've done this on another place I own down in Arkansas, was more of a, uh, a savanna type situation, where as I thinned the trees out, those native grasses came back on their own. I didn't have to plant anything. The big blue stem Indian grass, little blue, and some of the forbs and stuff were all down in there. Uh, and that's what I try to look at. And some of the areas that I'm thinning, I'm wanting to increase my acreage of warm season grass, so I may not be planting anything in there. I'm just letting it come. And after you do thinning, have you ever tried, you know, as far as size pressure, if you want something back there, like for strike burning and what the residual that's left? We did on my site. And uh, anybody from the Department of Conservation, Missouri Department of Conservation in there? I noticed they're absent today. So. But I, I will tell you this, when we tried to burn on our site, all right, so the thinning was a commercial thin. We did whole tree logging, so we drug the tops of the trees out, right? So we that night did a nice little raking and clearing job of skid trails, right? So then you have a lot of leaf litter on the ground, and even though it was a red flag day and the conservation agent said, I can't be here when you burn, and he left. Uh, we, uh, we did 
spread a lot of diesel and, and g gas mix out across there. And we sent up a lot of smoke and had a, I assume it was the Department of Conservation airplane fly over to check on us. But the leaf litter on there did not burn worth a darn. And even once you got a fire started, it hit, it hit where they'd skid, skid, trail, skid the material out, whoop, just died, right, and stopped. So we, we spent all day tinkering on, on one or two out of my five treatments and got nowhere. And so we quit doing that. We did a broadcast. He tried to rake it with a cedar tree, pulled a cedar tree, but as you'd catch a cedar tree on the stump, and there it, it just stays there, right? So we, had, we just did a, a heavy seed broadcast across there. That's one reason they were having to use heavier seeders. Less chance of those seed making good seed to soil contact. So in that instance, I, to a certain extent, the more you put on, the more seed potentially could come in contact with the soil. And if you've got the flexibility to manage and let those natives yep. come back up after you've opened it up and you can do some other management within there, if you've got the time flexibility to do that, because it just takes a yep. little bit of an extended process, I think there's probably good native seed within the soil bank. That's, that's a good point, Mark. We got pretty rocky soil down there, yeah. and so that was we did we did some broadcasting of warm season grass on some pine that we planted down there too, and uh, for that very fact that we just didn't think yeah. that soil be conducive. A lot of that, to, where some of this is, and where I work and where dusty stuff is down there, it, it's just pretty darn rocky and steep, and it's yeah. I don't it's think tough. so. Ken, it's looking a little rough right now. Post PhD and job change have not been good for me getting on, keeping on top of things. And uh, but we can look at that. And uh, and we've also had some other health issues amongst the trees too, which I think is a very interesting uh, dynamic in the, in a heavily thinned forest. So we might talk about that too to the for foresters out there who are interested in that. Jomi, do you have a? In a couple of years, Jomi, you've got to have all the answers now, right? <laughs> I think you've got to put a cage around your regeneration. I, I, that's all I can see is to put a cage around it. Now, you know, early on in this, I had some discussions with Mike Gold about the use of natural regeneration in the forest, too. Um, a couple challenges, as I, just as I saw them, and, and we went with artificial regeneration. For some reason, we foresters like to think of, in forested situations, only use natural regeneration. Out in the pasture, it's okay to put a tree out there. Well, so up in my site, we planted trees and put a cage around them. The benefit there that you did not, that you might not have wise with, otherwise with natural regen is I got to put the tree in specific locations. Right. Um, so you can kind of manipulate where that tree is. You can also pick the species of tree. You could do that in natural regen too. I think natural regeneration, timing is an issue. Uh, you can certainly do it, and that's an inexpensive way to use regeneration, and I think in some cases the the root system on natural regeneration is probably superior and and evident in the growth of the tree than when you try to do artificial but uh but i think you're still gonna have to put a cage around it to keep the livestock off do you have a thought on that yeah, i think the cage or some kind of <coughs> whether it be cage or some way to rig your electric fencing around those spots would be about the only way to do it Yeah. In in a sense, when you create civil pasture, you're you're creating a highly modified practice and set of system there when you graze it. 
it's no, it's more art of an artificial system right now as opposed to natural. Now, you, you know, you could hedge towards savannas and say, well, a savanna is real natural. That is true. <coughs> but when you graze it, you're still doing, it becomes a very highly regulated natural system. So, <coughs> I'm all choked up over the issue. <coughs> and I hate having a microphone on when I got to clear my throat, right? So. I've lost track of, of about yeah. seed selection for, you know, call it understory grass or, you know, when you're doing seeding in. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking to establish double pasture in, in two different situations. One where I've got a newly seeded pasture and, and putting, you know, little trees in there. And I've also got some established timber that has 40, 50 year old oak hickory in it. And I'm thinking it's potentially easier to get to a higher quality tilt pasture by thinning that timber versus trying to find open pasture. And I have this, it's called a power harrow, and I don't know if you're familiar with what that is. Um, it's Italian, you know, it's, it's like a versatile tiller where it kind of yep. spins, yep. but it has an integral seed box on it where I can, you know, drop seed yep. in as a harrow, and I can get into really tight places if I've been around trees and such. And I'm having a real hard time figuring out what species I want to seed down in that established overstory where the shade is, you know, it's reasonably shaded. And what specific, you know, grasses and forbs are you thinking establish well? I look at, well, the thing you got to look at are when, what's your overall forage base now? Do you already have plenty of cool season grasses and you're short on forage in the summertime? Then I might be looking at planting some of the native warm season grasses in there to provide that summertime grazing and some of the native warm season grasses will perform under that savanna type thinning uh, and provide good summertime grazing. Uh, if you still need some cool season grasses and I'm still, I hate monocultures uh, and I will always do a mix of grasses like uh, tall fescue, orchard, you know two or three grasses mixed with two or three legumes in there for that diversity uh, because all of them are going to play a role in that whole system and some of them will uh, grow better at different times even though they're all cool season grasses. They're, they've each got their niche uh, and I like that diversity. And if we're talking about, especially when we're talking about endophyte infected fescue, the other thing we get is, is dilution of that toxin so that the animal performance is better. The only thing I'd add is if you go with a native warm season, I'd hedge on adding a little bit more sunlight to that environment. Yep. So reduce your canopy a little bit more. Yeah. Because it, the warm season will that like. Does, does it make sense to put what is, you know, has the best tree cover to put in a warm season where you can run cattle in there during the highest heat stress period of the year and forage it perform better there too? I think that's kind of curious. I think that makes sense. Yeah, uh, goats is, there's a pretty good learning curve and about the time you think you're really smart, and I think that every few years, they, something comes along, slaps you upside the head and says, you're not quite that smart yet. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's some challenges with goats, you know, getting your fencing right first uh, and staying under the parasite management. That's why I still, you know, if we eliminate the browse too quick and they start grazing, uh, you're going to have a tendency to pick up more parasite load uh, with our cool, especially this year with the, the damper weather. Last year was no problem at all because it's so hot and dry, parasites couldn't live. So, but this year has been a challenge for a lot of producers. Uh, facilities, goats don't like to be cold and wet and they will typically hunt out some type of shelter when it's raining, like mine, we're looking for shelter today. On my place, that shelter, I don't have a barn in every pasture, but I've got, the way I divided mine up, and I've got 10 permanent paddocks on my place that I rotate through, but then I use a lot of poly wire in between to subdivide because I do management intensive, and I get pretty intensive sometimes. Uh, but 
I try to have access to where the goats can either get to one of the barns or they've got that wood lot, uh, that natural shelter. And in some cases, some of mine are cedar glades, uh, which I'm trying to reduce the cedar canopy on anyway, uh, but they provide good natural barns. But yeah, and part of this gets into some animal husbandry, and I've been doing it or for about 15 years now selecting. Well, of course, I'm in the Ozarks on steep rocky soils, and I figure if my goats can't keep their feet trimmed, somebody else needs to own them. Uh, again, I'm cheap and lazy. I don't like to trim feet. But I'm selecting for goats that have good, strong feet that, that don't tend to crack, don't tend to overgrow and all that, and for parasite resistance. And I think, I think that's where a lot of our small ruminant operators need to head to start selecting for goats that are adapted to that environment and have some uh, resistance to some of the things that, that's catching a lot of people. I think we need to, to cut on this one. Thanks to, to uh, Mark and Dusty. <laughs> now, we, we will again, we're going to go visit on Wednesday, so we'll have a chance to pick that up again and again talk with, with Charlotte. We'll also be at the site where we did the uh, hardwood civil pasture at, at Word Act, so we'll have a chance to pursue this further.